Thanks for joining us. Today I'm taking a look at a non-vintage champagne. So I've got here a bottle of Charles Hyde 6 Brut Reserve. Um, I guess um, the name Heidsick is, is seen widely throughout Champagne. There are several companies, Piper Heidsick, Heidsick Drum Monopole and Charles Heidsick. And this um, house takes the name of its founder. The ha house was founded in 1851. Um, all the houses, founders were related, they were cousins. Um, and um, what I guess Charles Heidsick is famous for is the, the pioneering work he did in developing the, the champagne market in the United States. He founded his own house in 1851. In 1852 he set sail for the US where as a sort of an outward going showman he became very well known promoting his champagne. So the, the sobriquet Champagne Charlie um, became affixed to him. Um, and I, I mean he was so successful that sort of a little over a decade later um, just before the uh, start of the, the American Civil War, he was, he was shipping nearly a third of a million bottles of champagne to the United States a year. So, very successful enterprise at that stage. Um, subsequently, the house has been through um, a number of ups and downs, um, has been taken over and subsumed into larger groups. Um, it was owned for, for quite a long time by Remy Cointreau, who sold it to a French luxury goods group called EPI. But during that period, its, um, its cellar masters, its management, it, it had a long period of continuity of, of the people making the wine. Firstly, um, winemaker Daniel Thibault um, was the cellar master when, when the house was sold by Henriot, where he'd originally worked, to um, Remy Cointreau. And one of his uh, team, uh, Remy Camus, um, continued his work after his death in 2002. Um, and uh, Thibault did a number of things that were sort of slightly revolutionary. First of all, um, he put a mise en cave date on his wine, so the date that the wine um, in bottle goes in, in bottle with its crown cap on uh, with the yeast into the cellars so that you can see how much time it's had on yeast and therefore how much richness it's gained from that. I mean for instance this particular bottle tells us that it was put in the cellars in 2017 and it was degorged in 2021 so it had nearly four years um, aging with its yeast lees which should, should make it quite rich. The other um, approach that Thibault used that was um, geared to quality and producing a rich style was he used up to about 40% of reserve wines um, in his wine. And the, the ideas that he put forward, uh, they're still um, used in, in making this wine today. So a high proportion of reserve wine, again, giving richness and complexity um, to, to the wine. Um, what else in terms of uh, the way the wine's made. It, it, it's blend, it's it's made up of about 40% Pinot Noir, so a red grape. Uh, alongside that, another 20% of, of Meunier, or Pinot Meunier as it's still occasionally known. Um, so again, a sort of richer style uh, coming from the red grapes. And then 40% of Chardonnay. Um, they talk about taking uh, wine from 60 different crews or villages where it's grown, so uh, quite a diverse set of sources. But when they're talking about the, the sort of villages that they're taking wines from, the examples they use, for instance, are Augier on the Côte de Blanc, um, which produces quite a, a rich style of, of, of Chardonnay, or Ambonnet um, on the Montagne de Rennes. Again, uh, for Pinot Noir, giving real richness and power to a wine. So th that's, that's very much the style here. And then uh, leaving that with its yeast lees in the bottle for four years again adds richness um, I believe five to ten percent of the wine actually ferments in in um, old burgundy barrels which will again add uh, an element of complexity because the different ferments will take slightly different courses in, in, in barrel whereas the, the balance ferments in, in stainless steel tanks um, so quite a number of ways of creating richness and complexity to the wine is, is, is the approach that's been followed. And actually, I, th I think it's a fair argument to say that I think the wines of um, uh, Charles Heitzig are really showing very well at the moment. They, they, they are, they've hit their stride very well. They're 
I think, great value. But let's let's taste the wine and see if that bears it out, shall we? First of all, I, I should say I'm, I'm using quite a large glass here. This is actually a Pinot Noir glass. Um, normally, I, I would drink champagne from a flute, but um, having spoken to one of um, Heitzig's representatives a while back, they suggested that because of the richness of the wine, a bigger glass would um, show that off better. So I, I would respect that. What I would say is possi possible downside of that is that it will allow the bubbles to dissipate more quickly. Although, uh, to be fair, they are still rising fairly steadily, and I've had this open for a, a few minutes now, so it's it's uh, it, it, it's not losing its fizz immediately. That's a good sign. That's a good sign of long long lees aging. The colour here, we've got a, um, a medium yellow, maybe a slight straw colour. Um, for the aromas, I shouldn't really need to swirl it to be honest, because the aromas are being thrown out of there. Um, there are yeasty notes, there are lemony notes, um, but the yeast is beautifully integrated. It doesn't sort of stand out particularly um, as sort of brioche or Vegemite in either of those sort of characters there. Um, so it's not bready. It's 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 not um, that more developed aroma. It, it it's more married to that sort of lemony fruit, maybe tiny touch, sort of apple touch of the fruit there. Um, but there's not a very pronounced um, fruit note at all, to be honest. There's more of a sort of a, a mellow, perhaps straw note. Um, let's taste it and see see how that develops. On the palate, that seems dry. I mean, this is this wine will have a dosage probably of about seven or eight grams at least, but it's crispness and there's a lean nature to the fruit on the attack that um, is making it seem lovely and dry. Um, initially, there's a freshness to the wine that, that will be coming from the Chardonnay. But then beyond that, there's a real sort of complex, fairly nutty, almost sort of slightly green nut, hazelnut, that sort of uh, note and yeastiness coming through on the palate to a richness. There's a rounded note to the finish where I suppose there's a slight creaminess as well. The texture of the bubbles is lovely. They haven't dissipated yet. Um, there's a smoothness, there's a very fine bead. Um, leading to a sort of a yeasty creamy lemony note on the finish but with added richness a touch of say candied peel or something like that um, maybe a little note of sort of lifted or orange blossom or something like that at the finish as well so this is a wonderfully complex wine it's very rich um, and actually I, I guess following on from the fact you've got it in a larger glass for its richness it, it would be a, a wine that would be great as, as a, a, a wine of gastronomy with sort of uh, white meats with pool or something like that where it's lovely acidity of that I and mean, this is why actually champagne often works really well with food because it's fabulous acidity cuts through um, I mean if you had this with something like a pork belly for instance the flavors of the champagne would come out it would cut through the um, the fats of that um, and the flavors the flavors are lasting beautifully well as I said an almost slightly smoky note to the finish now it's that sort of yeastiness developing in it on, on the tongue um, so yes uh, Charles Heitzig Brute Reserve thank you for watching hope you found this interesting bye now